Greetings and blessings YouTube. This is John the Jansenist once again and this is the second of the two questions that I received by 2C others regarding the Christian faith. <clears throat> this question reads, why did God allow so many variations of religious theology throughout the history of mankind? To preface my answer to this question, I'm going to refer back to part of my answer to the previous question. I had stated in the previous answer that God, because of his nature, is beyond our whole and complete understanding. Thus, there is an insurmountable gap, and then the alienation that resulted from the fall, as alluded to in Genesis 3, had erected a wall that separates us from knowing that that gap is there. We might have an intuitive sense that there is some form of alienation, we might be able to feel it, but we can't really fully define it based upon things as they are through a inquiry of the natural world that's around us. In keeping with this, there were many different ramifications to this wall being erected. With this wall being erected, we have now been cut off from any intuitive, rightful understanding of who God is, what God is, and what our functionality is as created beings under the dominion of God the Father. <clears throat> With this comes two things that are essentially at odds with what we refer to as the truth, being specifically Christian truth ignorance and error. Both of these are consequences of the wall that is the fall, that is the alienation and the advent of sin. With ignorance has come the propensity to create various understandings of the world, some of them partially true, some more partially true than others, but all of them insufficient in fully explaining or answering, I should say, that all-important and all-encompassing question of why are we here? From the Christian perspective, there are two answers to the command of God to be obedient and to worship. There is that answer which is commonly referred to from the Bible, not my will but thine be done, this is the confession of believers in full communion with the Christian faith. <clears throat> and there is not thine will, but mine be done. Which, I would argue, is the credo of everybody who is not in full communion with the Christian faith. Now, to expand upon this a little bit, I will use specifically the example of Adam, Garden of Eden, the trial and the failure via the forbidden fruit. <clears throat> it is easy to take note of the fact that Adam, and particularly Eve also, in being tempted by the serpent, were being tempted with the notion that you will be as gods. That's something that's specifically there in Genesis 3, and uh, I can provide a link uh, to the direct quote of that, and I'll put that in the description. The viewpoint of the pagan, the generic pagan, the non-Christian, I'll just put it that way, in all of its various manifestations, is predicated on the notion of will worship, which is the notion that the will of man is wholly autonomous and wholly able to perfect and fulfill itself through whatever subjective, to whatever subjective goal it seeks out. The Christian faith differs with that. It states that there is a very specific, already defined external purpose that has to be adhered to, and there's a specific set of standards for conducting yourself that, in many cases, are at odds with what is generally common sense among refined or unrefined pagans, as it were. But the interesting thing to note is this. Before the fall, before the exodus from Eden. I often pose this question to people who ask me the question of why so many different religions. What religion was in place during the days of paradise, the days of innocence before 
the ejection from Eden? The answer is, is that there was no religion in the sense that we currently understand it. Christianity didn't exist. Jesus Christ had not been born. He had not come in the flesh. He was there. He existed. He was in full communion with the Trinity. But his role as the mediator was not yet to come to pass because through the advent of time during the beginning there had been no fall. Therefore no mediator was necessary. There was a perfect communion and a perfect understanding via Adam's nature and by consequence Eve's nature that there were specific things that were expected of them and there were specific ways that they were supposed to conduct themselves. These were known fully intuitively by virtue of their nature. They knew what it was they were supposed to do. You don't need Christianity. You don't need the Israeli ceremonial laws. You don't need any of that. It's all internalized. With the fall comes corruption and with corruption the need for an external republication of the law, the moral law, and through the time of the state of Israel, the ceremonial laws that were meant to bolster the moral law, they were supportive laws and thus they were subservient to the moral law. The moral law begins, as is stated in the Gospels by Jesus, to love God with your whole heart and to love your neighbor as you would yourself. From that is drawn the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments tie in specifically with the moral law. And from these were derived the ceremonial laws, which were ways to keep the people of Israel speci specifically in a uniform adherence with the moral law. It was basically laws within the law that were very specific and were meant basic basically to keep them in line specifically with what they were supposed to do. That's the, perf the ultimate purpose of religion. And when you introduce ignorance and error into the equation, the possibilities abound. Christianity and Judaism before it, and Judeo-Christianity, which is basically the two together not in conflict with each other, which is the understanding of Christian Orthodoxy, is a remedy to the problem of sin and the problem of the fall specifically. They are brought in at a particular point in time and they form, perform a very specific purpose. Variations in Judeo-Christian thought that are outside of the tenets of orthodoxy and all of the other religions that are apart from it but still equal in their distinctiveness from Christianity from the Christian point of view are the result of an attempt by people in ignorance and in error to try to understand the nature of God with that gap and with that wall in place. When not bound by the limitations of a very specific revelation, when you're left with a world that you don't fully understand, the possibilities are endless. You can come to such conclusions as multi-faced gods, as a sort of uh, metaphorical way of showing through a physical depiction the all-seeing nature of God, having faces pointing in all directions. You can come up with uh, gods that take on the nature of animals because people see animals and they perceive them as being more uh, superior to us in certain ways and thus we ascribe the nature of God as a superior being and we visually represent it that way. But whether it be a different God than the one specifically laid out in the Old and New Testament, it be multiple gods or no gods, the only God being as Thomas Paine put it, my own mind and the reason that springs forth from it, that's the me paraphrasing him, I can't remember the exact quote at the moment. All of that is predicated on the notion of my will not thine be done. It's a product of the fall, essentially. And as such, it is endless in its possibilities unless you have all of these different religions popping up. Now, the question is, why did God allow all of these variations to occur? The real question that leads to that question is why did God allow sin to enter the world? 
And the answer is, is because there was a specific covenant, the covenant of works, which was very simple. It stated, do this and live, do not do this and die, and it pertains specifically to the forbidden fruit. That covenant was broken, and as a result of that covenant being broken, everything in creation was cursed as a result. And as a result of that curse, different religions entered into the equation via erroneous understandings of nature, of providence, and of God's nature, and you have everything here. And this is a logical consequence of the fall. As such, a new covenant was set up, and this covenant was the covenant of grace, the covenant of redemption. And this specifically was focused towards reclaiming those whom God chose out of the fallen to be forgiven, and who would, via his grace, be able to conform themselves to the law under the grace of Christ. This ability to conform to the law is a gradual lifelong process and it is not fulfilled until the point of death and even in death we approach God from a standpoint of guilt. The essential tenets of Christianity is that the there is an assembled collective guilt that is surrounding specifically the broken covenant of works. Christianity and Judaism before it in the nation state of Israel functions specifically as an answer to the question of the fall. And there are naturally other questions that come out of this. You know, why does God allow evil? Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? All of this is tied in specifically with this belief that all of mankind is alienated and as, as such all of mankind is not innocent. Only two people ever enjoyed a state of innocence and those were Adam and Eve and upon the fall that was lost. Contrary to what some other Christians might tell you, I do not believe that children are innocent. I believe that they're incomplete and that's a paraphrase from George Carlin of all people, a person who despised Christianity but on some level understood some of its basic tenets. So this is my answer regarding the nature of why all these religions were allowed. They were allowed specifically because a broken covenant was seen to full fruition and God being someone who does not go back on his word with regards to covenant fulfills his end even though we f fail to fulfill our end. All of the religions, the diversity that comes from all of them and all of the conflict that comes as a result of them is specifically our problem and God being all loving presents us with the solution via sovereign grace and this gets into Augustinian theology the the Pauline epistles the gospel all of it and it gets and it goes from there basically so if you have any questions that arise from a result of this explanation feel free to send them to me I'll try to get back to you in a timely fashion until next time in nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti God be with you all